Welcome to Oncology Today, a program focused on recent updates from the ASCO and EHA meetings on the management of multiple myeloma. This is medical oncologist Dr. Neil Love. For this program, I met with Dr. Joseph McHale from the City of Hope Cancer Center in Phoenix, Arizona. To begin, Dr. McHale reviewed some of the key data sets presented at these recent meetings. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Joseph McHale. I have the privilege of being a professor at the Translational Genomics Research Institute, which is part of the City of Hope Cancer Center here in Phoenix, Arizona, and the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation. These are exciting times, Neil, in the world of multiple myeloma. I've been doing myeloma for 25 years. I don't know if we've had a year quite like this. In terms of the number of new molecules and new approaches to treating myeloma, uh, and of course the impact that they're having in multiple myeloma. So I know we have a lot of things to chat about today, uh, several abstracts that we're going to review, uh, everything from frontline therapy to relapse and all in between. So uh, it really is a time when all aspects of myeloma are being uh, explored. And of course, even in a program like this, we can't cover it all because there's so much, uh, even in an early phase disease that is still being investigated right now. But I think it'd be important to start with some of the program, some of the, the uh, trials that are looking at not only just using quadruplet induction, which seems to be the way we've moved now from doublets to triplets to quadruplets in patients who are transplant eligible, but asking the question that I know almost every patient I work with wants to ask, which is, can I stop treatment? Do I really need to be on treatment forever? And one of the, I think, most brilliantly designed studies to evaluate this was the MASTER trial by Luciano Costa and his uh, colleagues from the uh, University of Alabama in Birmingham, uh, where they looked at, in this trial, the concept of saying, can we treat people so aggressively initially that we can actually stop treatment? And what they did is gave the quadruplet therapy of daratumumab plus carfilzomib plus lenalidomide and dexamethasone. So uh, that, uh, if you will, most aggressive uh, quadruplet that we have right now, Dara KRD. Patients do indeed get four cycles of that followed by an autologous stem cell transplant. And then they continue with consolidations of the same quadruplet until such time um, that they achieve MRD negativity on two occasions, what they call MRD sure, um, or at least eight cycles, and then they could go on to lenalidomide maintenance. And so the, the principle here is if I give this quadruplet before and after transplant until someone reaches that deepest of responses, will it allow us to potentially uh, consider discontinuing uh, therapy? And really, it was extraordinary in that we saw um, not only vast numbers of patients going into uh, MRD negativity in this MRD sure, but people staying in remission for very long periods of time, where we saw for both progression-free and overall survival, um, uh, really remarkable um, at, at three years, where 88% of people who did not have high-risk disease and 94% of people who did not have high-risk disease being uh, progression-free and alive at the three-year mark. The, the sobering part of this study, however, was as you see from the curves that when patients had at least one high-risk abnormality, and especially if they had two high-risk uh, cytogenetic abnormalities, that that progression-free survival and overall survival was significantly compromised. So they concluded that when patients with newly diagnosed myeloma that had zero or one high-risk cytogenetic abnormality, that this approach of giving DARA KRD transplant and an MRD-adapted intensification, you know, really did for most of those one-risk cytogenetic abnormality patients, in a, sense, in a sense, overcome that high-risk feature, almost blended to a certain degree the zero and the one groups together. And in that group, 80% of people achieved MRD negativity. However, again, the sobering piece was for those people that have um, higher risk cytogenic abnormality, sometimes we've called a double hit or even ultra high risk when there's more than one of them. Those patients, uh, unfortunately, that was not overcome with this more intensive strategy and stopping therapy in those individuals is likely not um, uh, the ideal uh, approach. So for each of these, I give you kind of Dr. Joe's thoughts here, Neil, uh, to, to spur a little bit of discussion. You know, I think this is such a critical 
study in its concept. You know, in a day where we're giving drug after drug after drug and forever, uh, I love giving my favorite drug nothing, nada, right? Patients love when you can stop treatment. And so now that we have better means of testing MRD negativity and now that we know when it is sustained, it's particularly powerful, I think this concept is really important. Uh, the question is whether or not really we can do this in all patients or just in low-risk patients. And it was an exploratory study. It hasn't made it definitive, but I do think it's going to help us move in that direction. In terms of the sort of overall trend or interest in looking at MRD, um, do you think that really helps nowadays from a clinical perspective? And sort of a related question, is there any reason to think we're curing anybody nowadays? Yeah, those are two fantastic questions, Neil. Of course, always your questions are great. But uh, the, the, the short answer is right now, actually formally, we don't have any of our guidelines that tell us to use MRD negativity to change practice. But we know it's coming. We know it is a powerful tool. I think what this study helps us see, Neil, actually, is that it is a tool. It is not the only tool. That if you were only to use the tool of MRD negativity, you may undertreat certain patients. Um, and so using it in conjunction with risk status may be quite helpful to help us determine that maybe that low risk patient who's gotten a really deep response and who sustained it for a period of time, we can de-escalate therapy. And at the other extreme, in a patient who's MRD positive with persistent disease, maybe it's time to intensify. But we're not quite ready to know exactly how to do that in clinic. And my concern is if people start saying, oh, well, I guess if you're MRD negative, I can stop treatment. We don't know that for sure. And we are doing studies that randomize people once they achieve that MRD negativity, sort of the natural outflow of MASTER. So I'm a little cautious to tell anybody that we should start using MRD routinely every day in clinical practice to make major decisions. But it does help us uh, be reassured. It helps us give, you know, in discussion with prognosis with patients. And in some situations, you know, it may help say, okay, well, look, um, the patient really wants to come off therapy. This is more evidence that they're likely to stay in remission for longer. And as for whether or not we're curing people, um, it really depends on how you define cure, right? I mean, we've always had a very small fraction of patients who go on a certain therapy and then come off and stay in remission the rest of their lives. I think that fraction is growing. But if you ask the average Joe on the street, you know, you can say that when your name's Joe, uh, the average Joe on the street, they think of cure as stopping all treatment and really never having to think about it again. I don't know if we have a large fraction of those patients yet, but I can see that coming with the way we're moving more intense therapies up front. I'll tell you why I asked that question, because actually, to tell you the truth, I've been thinking a lot about prostate cancer nowadays, because there was this big study that was just reported at the AUMA a meeting a few months ago. And there, you know, they had this sort of st stop and go approach based on PSA, which is extre an extremely good marker in prostate cancer. They recognize that people who have quote, PSA recurrence, which kind of like MRD positivity, you know, those patients are not curable, um, but they give intermittent therapy, multiple, and there's this big trial that came out that showed even more in terms of intermittent therapy, and they just kind of try to balance how much toxicity the patient's getting. This is kind of where I see things going there with, with these new studies in prostate, and I wonder if that's really the model that we're dealing with here. You know, it's like how long, you know, using MRD or your clinical, et cetera, to just judge when it would be safe to stop therapy for a while and give patient a break. Is that like too simplified a model? No, I don't think it's too simplified at all. And I think with tools that we have now that can get people into such a deep and durable response, you know, respecting the difference of biology of myeloma, that some people, unfortunately, with that highest risk disease probably just need to stay on therapy very long term until we, we crack the code a bit more, as it were. But you're absolutely right, because I think we are over-treating a lot of people. I mean, I think the concept of saying that I'm going to give maintenance therapy in everybody forever is, is just not biologically true. Um, and so if we can, you know, again, I don't want to be prophetic for the future, but I said that there is the tool of um, MRD, there's the tool of risk status. If I could 
clarify the third tool, I think those three together would be ideal. And that third tool is assessing someone's own immune system. Because what we're learning in myeloma is someone's good B cells and T cells and natural killer cells are a big part of them staying in remission or progressing. And so if we had a better way of measuring that, which of course we're learning, you know, the immune profile as it were, that you could see, Neil, people who have MRD negative, standard risk disease, with a good immune profile, we probably can stop treatment. By contrast, the people with high-risk disease, MRD positive, and a, and a weak immune profile are likely going to have to have a change in treatment, and so with all the spectrum in between. So I don't think your model of either intermittent treatment or being able to discontinue from prostate is inappropriate for myeloma. We just have to you know, obviously sort out those details. All right, please continue. Excellent. Well, moving on to uh, now looking uh, at what we're doing with um, uh, frontline therapy, where here we have um, another large study that was presented at ASCO, uh, uh, open label randomized phase three study of adding uh, elotuzumab to carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. So we just saw in the previous study that it was the daratumumab plus KRD. Here it's elotuzumab plus KRD in transplant eligible patients. Um, and, and this was an interesting study. It was presented as an oral abstract, generated a lot of conversation. We've been waiting for the study for a while, knowing uh, that it that was in development, um, that uh, as the DSMM um, uh, four, uh, or um, uh, 17 study, um, that here in the design, you can see that patients are getting, you know, three cycles of elotuzumab plus KRD. Their stem cells are collected. Um, they, they go through another three cycles. They get the transplant and then they have, um, consolidation, uh, thereafter and are con continued either on lenalidomide maintenance, which would be standard, uh, in the triplet arm or elotuzumab plus lenalidomide in the, in the, uh, uh, intervention arm. Obviously, it's a little bit early to make any deep uh, decisions around this or to make a lot of conclusions. But we did see, and no surprise, that when you add a fourth drug, there was a deeper response. Um, uh, patients uh, who achieved that deepest level of response uh, greater than VGPR was considerably higher in the quadruplet versus, versus the triplet. Um, and, and so it, this is early. I'm not sure anyone is rushing to uh, do this right now in the clinic. I say that respectfully because we've had some negative studies with the elotuzumab before. We know that it can work, especially in conjunction with immunomodulatory drugs like lenalidomide or pomalidomide. Um, but it's a little bit too early to know, is it going to change the later outcomes? Is this, is this more than just an initial difference in, in response? Is it going to make a difference in PFS and OS later? And will it actually change now that we're using a lot of CD38 up front? I always thought ELO was a really cool drug, and I was disappointed that it didn't sort of fly into uh, practice. But do you think it's possible we're going to end up with a quintuplet? Wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> and a lot of people have been asking that same question since this study came out. It's possible. I, it's possible that people will explore it. There are some very small studies that are looking at adding both the daratumumab or isotuximab as a CD38 antibody with the SLAMF7 antibody of elotuzumab. There's some biological rationale for that. Obviously, they're separate targets on the, on the, on the myeloma cell. Um, uh, although I think right now there's probably greater enthusiasm for using something like a bispecific antibody or even a tri-specific antibody, you know, uh, with using the targets of BCMA or, or the ones that we're going to chat about a little bit later, GPRC5D and FCRH5. The good piece of that, though, that you, that you mentioned, uh, when you talk about maybe adding a five drug combination is thankfully one of the features about elotuzumab is that there really isn't a lot of toxicity associated with it. We don't see a lot of the infusional reactions. We don't see a lot of cytopenias. We see some, of course, it's not like it, it doesn't have that activity, but it, it's not that much more um, than what we would see with, uh, with a triplet or a quadruplet already. So um, I'm not sure there's a huge zeal for that. I think people may want to see the longer term outcomes of this study first. Yeah, I'm sure if it weren't for bispecifics, there'd probably maybe be more interest, but everybody's dying to see what happens with bispecifics up front. Oh, absolutely. Or even CAR T cell therapy up front, you know, to, yeah, to for uh, sure. the biggest question of all is can we actually stop doing stem cell transplant? But I, uh, 
I don't want to. I don't want to offend the transplanters or the non-transplanters here, the Republicans or the Democrats. I'll stay as an independent until we have the data. Well, you won't be able to stay uh, in that way if, uh, by the end of this interview. Just as a little okay. hint. <laughs> We'll Excellent. get to that part. Oh, oh absolutely <laughs> we going. will. Absolutely we will. The next study, and Neil, actually I had the privilege of being a part of here, um, is looking at uh, the triplet combination that we've been using quite extensively now in earlier relapse of um, esituximab, obviously a CD38 monoclonal antibody, along with carfilzomib and dexamethasone, so the, uh, from the IKEMA study. And so this had been a large phase three study that had compared esituximab, carfilzomib, dex versus carfilzomib, dex alone. And so now we're doing all of the subgroup analyses and so on from that study. Um, and there has been a lot of interest in understanding what goes on biologically in patients that have extra copies of 1Q. And I can put 10 myeloma doctors in a room and I'll have 20 opinions about what we should think and do about 1Q. But we thought because we had rich cytogenetic data from the study that we would look a little bit more carefully at it. Uh, and first of all, um, to notice that it, it, from an incidence uh, of the 1Q uh, chromosome abnormality, this is really quite common in the sense that um, in both arms, uh, thankfully, so it's balanced, both uh, the ESA tuximab, carfilzomib dex arm and just the carfilzomib dex arm, we saw a, a large percentage of patients that had a 1Q abnormality, whether it was uh, isolated with no other cytogenic abnormality in about a quarter of patients. Um, or when it was in combination with other things, we saw it up to 40% of patients. And then importantly, and one of the things I think it was helpful in this study was we looked not just if you had one extra copy of 1Q, but if you had the amplification. So those multiple extra copies, albeit less common, as you see here, about 18% in the intervention arm and 12% in the, in the uh, control arm is really important, Neil, because that we know is a big difference. And, and where the question is, is if you just have isolated 1Q is by itself an issue. And so when we look at all of these people, you know, and, and looking at their, the subgroup analysis of patients that just have the 1Q abnormality or that have the 1Q abnormality in total, those who have just the isolated, just the gain, uh, just, or that have the amplification, uh, first of all, no surprise that the triplet combination is more effective, generally speaking, across the board than the doublet combination. I don't think that's particularly surprising. What was interesting was if we just overall look at the progression-free survival in patients with isolated 1Q, um, you see that it was 38 months in the intervention arm versus 16 months in the control arm, which is actually very similar to what we saw overall um, uh, when at patients had 1Q with other things, it did go down a little bit to 30 uh, months. And when, of course, people have amplification, it dropped all the way to 18 months. Still, in each case, superior to the control arm, but in, in, it's helping us tease out this notion that if I have a patient tomorrow with just isolated 1Q and that's it, I'm really not expecting them to have an inferior outcome necessarily compared to um, a patients if they have the 1Q with something else or, of course, they have the 1 amp. So lots of information here, but uh, first of all, it, it was having it in general obviously is a bad thing in the sense that, it, especially in conjunction with high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities, it, it reduced people's progression-free survival. We did see across the board that the triplet was better than the doublet. No surprises, no surprises there. Um, but uh, interestingly, uh, I think it, what it helps us see is that there is a bit of a gradation between just having one Q by itself, having one Q with other things, or having the, the one amp. And then each step up in that direction, unfortunately, we see uh, more inferior outcomes. So my general concept here is that, you know, this is a form of high-risk disease. We have to, we have to be careful because we want to not overcall or undercall it. Um, by itself, it's pretty close to the norm, but perhaps not as, not completely normal. So there's, there's a slight risk. If I see a patient tomorrow with just true isolated 1Q, I'm not going to pull the alarm bell here. Uh, there may be a slight increased risk to it, but it's nothing like some of these other cytogenic abnormalities. But when it is in conjunction with others, or if it's amplified, then I'm obviously a little bit more concerned.
So I'm kind of curious for the docs in practice, you know, certainly there are a lot of research implications of this, but in terms of docs in practice, in terms of practical implications of labeling a patient as high risk, you know, one of the main issues on the point of view of practicality is uh, whether or not you're going to use maintenance with uh, lenalidomide plus proteasome inhibitor. Uh, where do you fit 1Q into that decision? Yeah. So, so that's a great question. And I mean, prospectively, we're trying to look at that now. But I think, again, there's a split vote on this. I will confess there are sort of 1Q enthusiasts and 1Q dissenters. I'm a little bit closer to the dissenter side. If I have someone who has only 1Q, there's really no other high risk hygienic abnormality, I would still just give them lenalidomide maintenance because I don't think it confers that much of a high risk. Otherwise, we're going to be doing that for 40% of people. I'm, I'm just not sure that that's really the case. On the other hand, and if it's in conjunction with something else, they have a, a 414, they have a um, P53 deletion. So, I mean, those things by themselves would have made me concerned. But that that does definitely up the ante, as it were, and would make me want to be more aggressive in my maintenance and uh, trying to get that deeper response early on. What does the uh, Mayo, I forget the name of the risk thing you got, um, that they have. Oh, uh, 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 when I was at Mayo, yeah, we you do the M-Smart. Do they comment on this? Um, I'd have to go back and see what they're commenting now, but when when it was first released, um, they did add it to the list of cytogenetic abnormalities that have to be conser- uh, be considered. But I don't think by itself it would have invoked a, a change in the dual maintenance therapy. But I, I'd have to go back. They're constantly updating this. I think this data may you know further influence that kind of thinking. What do you consider the best resource for a doc to you know look up the issue of uh, whether something's high risk or not? Uh, they should watch a research to practice program on <laughs> high risk disease. <laughs> that, okay. it's, it typically, right. I mean, it's hard. I mean, I think M Smart is helpful. Uh, there, there's no doubt that that it, that it it tries to guide people that way at msmart.org. Uh, lots of different institutions and do it differently. I think now, thankfully, even the labs that are reporting these hmm. out are you know embedding the latest data into them I'm, I'm quite impressed with our pathology colleagues and how they're you know trying to help people um, uh, navigate them but you know this is why we need ongoing CME boss because uh, it changes all the time all right please continue absolutely so the next study we'll just have a quick look at um, was also including esotuximab, but now not in combination with carfilzomib index, but with pomalidomide index in the Ikaria study as well as the uh, Ikema study. So we we looked at a subgroup, or Philippe Moreau here looked at a subgroup analysis. This was a, a poster that was presented at the European Hematology Association this year of looking at people with that ultra high risk cytogenetic. So this is a nice theme that you're uh, bringing us through today, um, uh, Neil, of thinking about you know such a variable disease in myeloma, right, from the standard risk to the high risk, to really now this ultra high risk, which was, we learned right from the first study today in the master trial, that these patients really have an unusual biology and uh, are very are very difficult to, to control. And so, uh, you know, they concluded in looking at this, and I know there's a lot of detail on this on this table here, but tried to squeeze it all into one so you could see from both the Acaria study with POM and the Ikema study with uh, uh, carfilzomib um, uh, that we could see um, the differences in these high risk groups. First of all, you sort of notice immediately that most of them don't get very, very deep responses. You know that the overall response rates um, are are uh, lower in that uh, ultra high risk group. Um, that nonetheless, triplets were still better than doublets, which you know, frankly, is is not a shocking new um, uh, conclusion here, but it is demonstrating that even when you look at that highest risk group, more is better, generally speaking, for these uh, patients. Um, and this isn't enough. The triplets that we're using right now, um, whether it's with esotuximab and POM or esotuximab and carfilzomib, better than doublet, but there's still an unmet need, as it were, here. There's still a challenge here. Almost the same conclusion, if you will, Neil, that we saw from the master trial, that that we need something a bit more revolutionary for these ultra-high-risk patients that have uh, you know, multiple cytogenetic abnormalities. And that was really my take on it, that triplets still are better than doublets in high-risk disease, um, but ultra-high risk is still a challenge. And 
you know, Neil, I can tell you from multiple cooperative groups and trials and groups and so on, we've tried to do studies exclusively in this group, but it's hard because, you know, this thankfully isn't a large fraction of patients. So it's hard to do a study that only includes ultra high risk patients. But naturally, we see in so many of these studies that when they look at the subgroup analysis of that high risk group, they're much more likely to relapse more quickly uh, than than uh, even even routine or historical high risk disease. Again, getting back to the doc and community-based practice, uh, nowadays, uh, how much interest is there in carfilzomib as opposed to bortezomib in high-risk patients? Yeah, I, I think that's actually very, it's a great question, of course, but it's also very regional, right? And it's, a, it's what people have been comfortable with. There are certain areas that have really promoted it more, like in, in you know, our friends at Emory and in that region, uh, and certain centers have pushed it up in Hackensack, have been much more comfortable using it. And so it's influenced the region around them. So, you know, I always think of the community oncologist having a, a lifeline to a myeloma doctor somewhere. I try to be the lifeline to all the, all the community oncologists here in Phoenix, um, and I think with more and more data that's coming out, including, you know, other quadruplets that are coming out with carfilzomib, I think we will see um, a shift to that right now. I do favor it in those patients with the ultra high risk disease. I also favor it in patients, by the way, who, who I think I'm nervous about giving bortezomib to who have a, you know, pre-existing neuropathy or something like that. I think, you know, previously the endurance study put a little bit of, you know, uh, dampening efforts on carfilzomib frontline. But we have to remember that was exactly in the group of people we're not talking about. Those are people essentially not going to transplant and without high risk disease. So I think in high risk disease, um, I tend to favor using carfilzomib frontline. Uh, and even at first relapse, if someone hasn't had carfilzomib or pomalidomide, I think they're both very effective agents. But I tend to favor a carfilzomib strategy or a carfilzomib including strategy um, at that first relapse. All right, please continue. Excellent. And so maybe um, one of the most important studies we've had in myeloma over the last few years, we saw a little bit of an update to it. And, and I believe that at the end of our talk, we're going to emphasize this again, you know, has been the Cartitude 1 study. So this was the um, critical study that introduced to us using uh, siltacel uh, as a CAR-T strategy in patients with heavily relapsed disease. Uh, it led to its approval, which now in patients with four or more prior lines of therapy can be eligible for. Um, and really impressive here um, that we're seeing um, it's sustained, right? So we, f in the early days of CARTITUDE 1, we all, even us as geeky myeloma doctors had our jaws on the floor when, you know, data was presented where we saw response rates over 95%, you know, where we saw all but two patients of 98 respond uh, to, to this regimen. But th one of the natural questions was, was how long is it going to last? Um, and you can see here in the longer term follow-up that at the 50% line, your, your patients are over 33 months. They're nearly at three years. Um, of progression-free survival. And that's really remarkable. Neil, you know, these these would have been people, of course, heavily pretreated, six prior lines of therapy on average. These are patients who we would have expected prior to the days of cartitude that their overall survival would, would be at least less than a year, if not less than eight months. So to provide that kind of uh, outcome for patients is really quite um, is really quite impressive. I mean, this is unprecedented uh, three-year PFS, especially, you know, one of the things that we talked a little bit about earlier was whether or not people can stop therapy. One of the most gratifying features of giving a patient a CAR T-cell therapy is being able to stop treatment. You know, and so many of our patients are very, very thankful for that, you know, as they continue on uh, NADA therapy, as I said earlier, you know, the nothing therapy is so good. Uh, and thankfully, there really wasn't any sort of brand new toxicity concerns that were raised. There had been some concern about would there be more unusual neurotoxicities longer down the line, and we just haven't seen that. So um, a couple of questions about Siltacel. First of all, where do things stand now? Early on, they saw some neurologic issues, sort of Parkinsonian type things. And it seems like I'm hearing less about that. Is that sort of been ironed out? 
I wouldn't say it's been entirely ironed out, but people now with larger and larger groups of us giving this drug and, and reporting it, it, it still happens. It seems to be a very small fraction of patients. We're still trying to collate together and work together. Is there a way to predict that? When I see a small fraction of patients, like it's maybe 1% of people. Um, uh, and, and that's not insignificant if you're that one person, of course. And so every patient matters and, and, and we have to be very careful with that. I think one of the reasons why maybe uh, Neil, we're seeing a little bit less of that. You know, there, there are aspects of neurological toxicity we don't really understand, and we've never really understood. Why does every single plasma cell disorder have a mysterious connection to the neurological system? Right? People with neuropathy and myeloma, it's not just because they've been on bortezomib or previously been on thalidomide. It's the disease itself. You know, we have cousin diseases like poems and others that almost always have the neuropathy associated with it. So there is, I don't want to sound too uh, mystical about it, but there is some mystical connection between plasma cells and nerves that we don't fully understand. But if we think of bispecifics and CAR T-cell therapy, and we're, we're messing with the immune system in that way and with their T cells. We see the cytokine release syndrome. We see the neurological toxicities. I think that as we become a little bit more aggressive in not only managing them, but even in some patients truly preventing them, and we're seeing some prospective studies giving the tocilizumab or steroids even up front, we're, we're seeing a reduction in all of the both short-term and long-term implications. So I'm hoping that some of these longer-term neurological things that we still see, thankfully occasionally, but still see, may even go down more so if we continue that more aggressive upfront management of those toxicities. Have you yourself seen a patient who had this? And like, what, what do you see? Is, is it Parkinsonian or what, what, and when do you see it? So uh, I personally have not had one of my patients go through, but one of my colleagues has. Um, and yeah, it, it, it seems very Parkinsonian. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the patient ultimately uh, passed away. Um, but it, it does mimic that. And of course, when we talk about neurological toxicities, it can be almost anything, right? It can typically be sort of mild confusion, maybe even a headache. You know, for most of that, that's resolved in the short term. And then you may remember in the early days of the uh, bispecific agents, we've had several bispecifics that have actually been dropped because of unusual neurological toxicities, not so much Parkinsonian ones, but uh, neuropathies that were either sensory or even motor. So I, and there's still a lot to learn from it. All we know is that when patients uh, develop any of these symptoms, usually in conjunction with our neurological colleagues, we're trying to monitor them, find out uh, is there any other mitigating factors like anything other neurotoxicity that they may be experiencing, uh, and then managing them uh, primarily with steroids in the short term. Uh, but it, it, it can be really devastating. These uh, longer-term data with silto cell are really impressive. Uh, I'm curious what the current thinking is. It kind of, I mean, it sort of seems when you do indirect comparison of silto cell to, for example, Ida cell, it looks like the response rate's greater. Uh, of course, that's indirect. Uh, any new thinking about what it is that's creating the uh, treatment benefit with silto cell? I've heard people talk about the construct of it. Uh, being somewhat different than I just felt. Yeah, the, the construct is different in the way it binds that we would think it has, you know, with two binding sites as opposed to one. So it, it's perhaps, you know, more prolific in its ability to, you know, bind, uh, um, as, as the T cells uh, proliferate and, and attack the myeloma. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I'm, I'm a little bit cautious to overcall that because for two reasons. One, because the first drug in any class or any approach always gets the tougher, tougher road, right? They have to build the trail and there are toxicities that we haven't, you know, quite learned how to manage yet and, and so on. And then secondly, right now there's still a, a rather, I would say, significant shortage, Neil. Um, and so, um, I, I saw a patient the other day who said, oh, well, I was told that, um, that Siltacel is better. And my center offered me Idacel and I said no. So I'm going to wait until Siltacel is available to me. And I was a little bit concerned about that because um, although there, there may indeed be some difference, you know, CAR-T is still such a dramatic benefit, right? And, you know, again, not to make light of these things, but someone says, you know, what's your, what's your favorite drink, Neil? Well, the one in my hand, right? As long as you have one, you know, that's a right. good thing. And I do worry that 
um, until we have a more formal comparison. That being said, we are seeing a ramping up of production. We are seeing, thankfully, with a greater emphasis on health equity, which is what I do a lot in, in my own work in health disparities, that we're trying to find ways to bridge part of that gap because there are still so many patients, unfortunately, who have not been able to benefit from CAR-T. All right, please continue. So on the subject of, <laughs> of cell to cell, if Neil, we were confined to 10 minutes today, which would sadden me because I like spending time with you, but if we had only 10 minutes today and I could really only present one abstract from the year 2023 thus far, remember we haven't gone to ASH yet, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, setting us up for a good discussion after ASH because I know there are going to be lots of great things. It, it would be this study. And this was uh, beautifully designed, the Cartitude 4 study took cell to cell that previously, as we showed, was beneficial in at least four prior lines of therapy, and now compared it in a randomized fashion to the standard of care, primarily with PVD, so pomalidomide bortezomib dex, or DPD, daratumumab pomalidomide dex, which that second one is probably arguably the, the most commonly used uh, early relapse regimen, um, in patients very carefully here with one to three prior lines of therapy. We had previously seen the KARMA-3 study uh, done with IDACEL in patients with two to four prior lines, but now we're bringing it up even earlier uh, at that very first relapse. Um, and so this actually turned out to be uh, the plenary in the plenary program at uh, EHA and, of course, in the oral program at ASCO. And the excitement, I think, was legitimate because um, we saw a dramatic difference uh, first of all, we saw that the median progression-free survival for those patients getting either DPD or PVD, no surprise when you look not just at first relapse, but second and third relapse, was about 12 months. So I think that's honestly what we would likely see in clinical practice. So, so it, it reflected the reality. But here with the cell intervention, um, that the PFS had not even been reached yet. And if you look at that, you know, 50% line, it, it's still going out way past, you know, 28 months, 30 months. Like we're definitely going to be beyond two years with the 12 month PFS rate being 76%. Um, obviously time will tell exactly where that lands, but the difference between those curves is, is pretty much undeniable. And that was, of course, driven by, um, you know, an almost 20% difference in response rate. And I particularly want to notice, uh, uh, Neil, not just the overall response rate of basically 85% to 67%, but notice the difference in depth of response. As we've learned in myeloma, depth of response matters in particular. And so whereas with the triplet combinations, uh, about 21% of patients got into complete remission or better. With the Silta cell, we saw 73%. And so that's why I think we're seeing such a difference in the progression-free survival uh, thereafter, because it's driven by that, that uh, difference. Um, and, and so when you look at the as-treated population as opposed to intent to treat, you know, the response rate we saw with Silta cell was almost all patients. 99%. Uh, it's a little bit too early to measure the exact progression-free survival in that group as opposed to an intent to treat. But of course, you know, for purposes of a phase three, we look at the intent to treat analysis. But what this is telling us at least is those people who truly got silta cell, which by the way, if I can just put a side note here, we have to be careful. Not everybody who intends to get silta cell gets it. Right, that is still a problem. Not everybody can we collect the T cells. Not everybody can we do the manufacturing. I think that fraction will continue to shrink, Neil, with time as we get better at those processes. But it's still there are still a percentage of patients that don't quite get that. Um, the other major learning from this trial, and that's why I put a few extra slides for this trial, Neil, was not only did we see a rather massive difference in efficacy. Um, Obviously, this is still CAR T-cell therapy. It still <laughs> induces toxicities, and we still saw uh, cytokine release syndrome in 76% of patients, albeit only 1% of patients grade three or four. And for those who treat CRS, there is a massive difference between grade two and grade three, right? Grade three is where people do require um, uh, cardiovascular or respiratory support, typically in an ICU setting, whereas grade one and grade two, we can typically manage either in a regular hospital or even as an outpatient. Um, but we're seeing lower numbers than what we saw when patients had four or more prior lines. Similarly, with the neurotoxicity, 
although we still saw it in a small fraction of patients here, including ICANs and some things like cranial nerve palsies and peripheral neuropathies, um, many of these patients had their, um, their neurological issue resolve and the incidence was lower than what we saw uh, in later Lyme disease. So the authors concluded, I think appropriate, appropriately, that there was a significantly uh, prolonged progression-free survival as the primary endpoint here with a hazard ratio of 0.26, Neil, kind of hard to deny that. And it was really seen pretty much in all subgroups. I didn't get time to go into all that detail, but we did see it across the board, no surprise, driven by a much deeper response rate. And that not only were the, the CAR T specific adverse events typically manageable, I think we saw less of them than what we typically saw uh, in later Lyme disease. And so, uh, this has really, I think, brought a lot of excitement to the myeloma community. Arguably, as I've mentioned, perhaps the most important abstract that we can discuss this year thus far clearly showed the benefit of CAR T. Um, and, and it makes biological sense, right? People's T cells are, are uh, not as beaten down. Uh, and typically, whenever we introduce anything, and earlier Lyme disease uh, patients uh, benefit. And this is almost definitely going to lead to its approval. It's still obviously under FDA review. And I, I, I think we don't have a, a, a real PADUFA date until uh, 2024. Um, but I think it's going to move us in that direction. And lastly, I think I'm quite encouraged by the fact that we saw less toxicity, which is a combination of using it earlier and us being more comfortable with it. But that does reassure us that it's not like, oh, we introduced CAR-T and people that have much more vigorous T cells and we see more uh, toxicity, for example, as some may have predicted. So I think that's very reassuring and going to be a big part of what we do in the future, Neil. And uh, coming up from behind, but coming in strong or by specific. So we'll see how it's all going to play out, everything, which going to come first. But I've just got to ask you, we just did a webinar uh, last week with Katie Moore, the principal investigator of the SOLO-1 trial, looking at a PARP inhibitor's and BRCA patients. This week, we're going to do uh, a program uh, on lung cancer. We're going to talk about adjuvant osimertinib. Both of those interventions had hazard rates around 0.2, which I had never seen before. 0.26 in myeloma. I'm trying to think of any trial, any intervention that had that kind of hazard rate. I've not seen that. And and you and I have so, been around the block a few times. So, I mean, I think that's a pretty impressive hazard ratio. And I, I, I think, as I say, I, I, I can never predict what's going to happen. But my, but most of us really strongly believe that this will lead to a, a new indication for cell to cell. And then I guess the, the real question is going to be, at least initially, because like I said, bispecifics coming along, who knows where that's going to uh, land. But what do you think, you know, if, let's say 2024, or maybe not that much new beyond that, like, if you could, where would you put it? Yeah, I mean, I think, obviously, it's still early to see the data where we bring it even yet earlier. And, you know, I'm just opening a trial this week in my center where we're comparing CAR-T to stem cell transplant. As, as we've said, that, that's, a, that's a whole other discussion that I know we're going to come to later. But right now, I mean, I think... Most of us feel that although there's no perfect sequence, it hasn't been worked out yet. If I had a choice, let's say I had both CAR T and bispecifics available to me in early relapse, I think most of us would favor doing the CAR T first, Neil, for a few reasons. One, it still is the deepest response we've seen, right? So all the bispecifics are around, I mean, to keep it super simple, two thirds of patients respond, right? 65, maybe up to 74%. With CAR-T, it's over 90, generally speaking now, if not over 80 at least. So there is a bit of a difference. Secondly, the benefit of doing the CAR-T is that patients get to stop therapy. And there's no doubt that people, you know, enjoy that and like that. Uh, and then thirdly, and again, still has to be confirmed, but biologically speaking, it makes a little bit more sense to give a CAR-T and then give your T cells a rest for that long period of time and then, sadly, when the disease wakes up, to then introduce a bispecific. We are having some difficulty in patients who have been on bispecifics taking them right to CAR-T because their T cells have been, you know, kind of flogged or used for a while. It does speak to whether or not we should really continue bispecifics forever, and I'm sure we'll come to that in a few minutes. But, um, but, but that's roughly where I would put it now in my thinking. All right. Please continue. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's move in the same vein of discussing um, earlier CAR T strategies. I mentioned earlier that the Karma Three study um, was was actually predated the this Cartitude Four that we just re uh, reviewed, which was bringing I to cell in patients with two to four prior lines of therapy um, and comparing it to standard regimens. Again, mostly the triplets that you see there, DPD, DVD with daratumumab, bortezomib, uh, even ixazomib, lenalidomide, and then uh, uh, elotuzumab and pomalidomide, and even uh, a doublet of carfilzomib and dex. So trying to see what was the standard of care comparing it to idle cell. And what was presented in this study was not just the overall Karma 3 result. We've known that for a while. It was New England Journal published. We saw, similar to what we just saw with Cartitude 4, a really nice difference. But they particularly wanted to look in this analysis at those high-risk patients because one could argue, you know, as we, you know, have less resource to CAR-T, as we have typically tried to use our most aggressive forms of therapy with the most aggressive uh, forms of disease, uh, that we want to see does CAR-T help overcome some of those uh, high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities? Is there a way to better the outcomes of these patients? And so you can see here, again, you know, this is now getting into pretty small numbers, so it's hard to be overly swayed by the results here, but it was an important analysis where we looked at high-risk cytogenetics based on revised international staging system, based on measures of tumor burden by plasma cells in the bone marrow, the presence of extramedullary plasma cytosis, and those patients who had true triple-class refractory uh, uh, disease. Uh, and the bottom line, lots of information here, but the bottom line was really across the board, no surprise, but importantly, that we saw a benefit of the CAR-T over those uh, triplets or doublets. Um, and, and quite, again, maybe not the 0.26 that we just saw a few minutes ago, but still very impressive uh, differences uh, between these two with hazard ratios, you know, basically between 0.4 and 0.6 for most of these groups. And so I do think it is important for us to see that we can, you know, intervene with this aggressive therapy, with CAR T-cell therapy in uh, those highest risk patients. And so uh, that's what they concluded, that the benefit was pretty much seen across the board. There's still a jury, I think, is still out on whether or not measuring serum BCMA levels makes much of a difference in these patients. Uh, but like we've seen with... Um, Siltacel being brought earlier, uh, we, we saw with Idacel that it was a little less toxic when given in two to four prior lines, and that held true even in the highest risk patients. So for me, I think this is an important subgroup of the Karma 3 trial, that even in the highest risk subgroups, we see good outcomes, better outcomes with Idacel, so much better than what we see with our triplets and doublets that we're currently using. Um, and uh, there may be a subset of patients in whom, you know, we, we just know, unfortunately, that they have have a very poor outcome by virtue of their ultra high risk disease where I want to get a CAR T to them as soon as possible. Do you think we might uh, get to a point with CAR T that we, you know, as it, we see trials moving it up, different combinations that we're going to, you know, just sort of look at them as I'm not, you know, a similar class, you know, kind of like right now where, you know, whatever you can get, you take, you sort of view them as equivalent. If you want to get silta cell, but you can't get it, but you can get eye to cell, you do it. Do you think we're going to continue that paradigm as we move earlier and earlier? We're going to need trials for everything. I, I do think so. I mean, I do because there is still a, a supply challenge. There's still an issue. And, and the differences between them, uh, although, you know, again, you know, even comparing, for example, Cartitude 4 and Car Karma 3 is not fair because Cartitude 4 had one to three prior lines. This one had two to four. So there's quite a bit of difference in that one extra line. Um, you know, and that, that's what, what helps me, you know, appreciate the value of both agents. And I'm not just trying to be a good politician here and say everybody's good. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I just, I want to advocate for my patients and give them the best treatment possible. And so I do think that, you know, if both, because both of them now have these phase three studies, both of them are New England Journal published, both of them are submitted to the FDA for review. You know, we're hoping that they'll both get that indication. And, you know, some centers are more comfortable with one over the other. Some centers have had more experience with one. So, um, you know, some have joked and said, this is another Coke, Pepsi kind of situation, you know, and, and maybe you favor one over the other. But at the end of the day, there probably isn't as big a difference between them as people make out. All right, please continue. 
Um, so this was an important um, study, and I want to highlight it because basically everything we've talked about so far with CAR T have been focused on uh, BCMA, you know, B cell maturation antigen, which, by the way, is a really attractive antigen because it's very prolifically expressed on myeloma cells. It, even after people have had a BCMA driven strategy, there seems to be the potential to go back to another BCMA strategy, even though I mentioned it may not be ideal to go from bispecific to a CAR T. But as more and more people are getting treated with BCMA strategies, uh, Neil, we're going to want to have different targets. And the target that has emerged, and of course, we just recently had the approval of talquetamab as a bispecific antibody that targets GPRC5D or G protein coupled receptor class C group 5 member D say that 10 times, um, GPRC5D, they all sound like license plates anyway, but uh, GPRC5D, now we see this, um, one of the first studies to do this as a CAR-T strategy. So I think this is, this is important because this is now saying, okay, we can leverage the power of CAR-T, but now with a different target. Because if there's one general theme we're seeing is that although you can go BCMA to BCMA, there's typically a drop in the response rate and the progression-free survival, partly because people have had more lines of therapy, but partly because you've already used that target. So if we could use a different target, maybe there could be a different outcome, and that's why we're looking at these. And so, you know, obviously that they wanted to generate a product that would not uh, target BCMA as we've historically uh, targeted with uh, Ida cell and Silta cell, uh, and to see if we can now target GPRC5D, which is also heavily expressed in myeloma cells, but interestingly also have some other off-target locations, which include the 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 taste buds, the skin, uh, the hair, and the nails, which is one of the reasons why we see a, a bit of a different toxicity profile. So without going too much detail here, this is a fairly classic phase one design with a increasing dosing strategy across the board with the standard process of you know collecting the T cell manufacturing them, reinfusing them to patients. Uh, but what was interesting here is, uh, granted, if you look at the bottom, these are relatively small numbers, but even if we look overall, 52 patients, we saw a response rate of 86%. So that clearly puts it in the category of what we've been seeing um, with these patients heavily pretreated uh, with, with uh, these strategies. And what's interesting was that um, we saw um, really good response even in those patients that had had a prior BCMA. Maybe that number was a little bit lower and that could speak to the fact that some of their T cells had, had been already uh, engaged, uh, but still 76%. I mean, got to remember a couple of years ago, Neil, when you and I do these, these, these programs together, we had, you know, drugs with response rates of 25%. We were happy. I mean, we're still tripling that. Um, and, and so I think it, it's important to see that I wouldn't say it's entirely agnostic of prior BCMA. But we definitely see benefit whether they had had bad prior BCMA or not. And without prior BCMA, 96% is very, very impressive. So I think this is exciting because it's the first CAR T cell to target GPRC5D. Now, as we bring more and more BCMA driven strategies through CAR T, through bispecifics to some degree, still through antibody drug conjugates, I think it's going to be very valuable to have another target in the CAR T paradigm. Uh, and although it may seem a little bit uh, less effective in those who had previously had BCMA, still uh, extraordinary response rate and still worth exploring. So, yeah, just flashing on, you know, when you were talking about we were happy with the drugs that have lower response rates, you know. How we struggle to give cell an exer. And I remember, you know, I'd love to get in your, in your approach to that, but you know, this seems like a little bit more impressive. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and those drugs were important and, and still sometimes you want to just give an oral drug to a patient. I'll, I'll give you that, right? Some right. people still will That's just true. never access CAR T, Neil, as you know, right? Geographically, sadly, it has affected certain race and ethnicities more than others. But nonetheless, there are still a lot of challenges getting to CAR T. I mean, look how many years we've been doing stem cell transplant in patients. We still get tra can't get transplant for certain uh, individuals and groups. So, so I understand that. And so there is a role for that. But wow, what a difference here as we see these kinds of response rates for sure. 
And on the subject of those buy specifics, uh, let's turn our thoughts to to Clistamab, which was the first of the approved buy specific antibodies uh, in myeloma uh, that, of course, adheres to both the BCMA um, antigen on the myeloma cell and the CD3 antigen on the T cell. Um, and in the Majestic One study, which we saw follow up from, it was really impressive that you know we saw a response rate of sixty three percent, so pretty much two thirds of these patients who were very heavily pretreated, as you can see here, median five prior lines of therapy uh, respond. The initial design of the study, of course, is that we give teclistamab weekly um, indefinitely after they've had two step-up doses uh, in the clinic. Uh, but it, to me, this was the pivotal trial that led to the approval of this drug that we're now using quite extensively across the country. Um, it may not have the same efficacy, of course, of CAR-T that we're seeing, you know, 86 and 90%, 95% response rates, but still double what we'd had with the prior agents, you know, at 63, 65%. Um, and of course, it's right off the shelf, right? We're not necessary. We're not having to collect T cells, and for some patients, that's a that's a challenge. And then we wait. Sometimes the manufacturing of CAR T can be six or eight weeks. So here, we're just treating patients right away. We are seeing lower cytokine release syndrome or CRS rates uh, than what we saw with CAR T. I think what's putting a little bit of a pause or caution is that as we treat these people ongoing and ongoing and ongoing, we found that we really heavily immunosuppress these patients, Neil. I mean, um, the vast majority become hypogammagallinemic. Many of them can develop infections and sometimes they're weird and unusual infections that we almost you know, relate to the aloe transplant clinic. Uh, and so I think we still have a lot to learn about dosing. I know that for many of us, as we use teclistamab, especially as patients get into a deep response, that we've been backing off the dosing, going down to every other week, sometimes even once a month, depending. And I think with time, we'll hopefully find that sweet spot. And maybe even in light of our conversation earlier, Neil, we might even be able to stop uh, treatment in some of these patients after they've gotten a deep response. Any sense right now to what extent by specifics, not just teclistamab, but are being utilized by general medical oncologists in the community, or do you think mainly it's still in academic centers? I still see mainly, and I have, thankfully, in my role at the IMF, I kind of, Switzerland-like role, I like to work with everybody, and I try to get a pulse of what's happening. I think the way I would think it, Neil, is the overwhelming majority are in the larger academic settings. But there is a tier of oncology groups, and they typically tend to be the larger groups that have an affiliated hospital close to them or working through a hospital system, that many of them are adopting it early on. For the majority of, I um, mean, not that there are too many solo practices, but smaller oncology groups, what's happening there is um, – if they do treat at all, the first several cycles or at least the first two cycles are given the academic center and then they're sending them back. You know, that's what we're trying to do in our centers. We, we're telling our community oncologists, look, send us your patient. We'll give them the first eight weeks, the first two, two full cycles of teclistamab, and then you can continue in your clinic. Because really after that, there's essentially no risk of ongoing cytokine release syndrome or particular toxicities. But it does require good communication between the two because there are things that maybe the community oncologist is not as familiar with, such as the hypogamma globulinemia to that degree, the risk of infection. And so I still think it's incumbent on us as the myeloma geeks to figure out the best way to manage people in the long term before we burden a lot of community oncologists with that complexity. In order to give uh, one of these vice specifics, do you need to have access to tozolizumab? And do most general medical oncology offices have that? Uh, they do not. Um, um, most of them, that's why I said the ones that have taken it up are those that are, have sort of an hospital affiliation and have that already. Um, whether or not that's absolutely necessary after a patient has had multiple lines of therapy is a bit of a different consideration. They still have to go through certain training and so on. But people have found ways around it of making sure within their group and in their area that there is a dose of TOSI somewhere. Uh, but we've really not had to use it after those first two cycles, Neil. I mean, it really is a short-term phenomenon. And so for a lot of community oncologists who are transplant process and work with a team that they send their patients to their transplant back and forth, we're trying to leverage those same, uh, you know, if you will, uh, uh, processes to ensure that patients transition appropriately. All right, please continue. 
Okay, so on the subject of yet another bispecific, so this is the the third approved bispecific, but the second that was BCMA directed, uh, l renatumab And this was evaluated in the magnetism studies. Um, and it was interesting because there were two, uh, I think, important studies presented at uh, both ASCO and EHA this year. This was Mohamed Moti's presentation at EHA um, where they looked at e- both patients that had had a BCMA-directed therapy before and those that did not. So cohort, cohort A did not. Those who did were, were cohort uh, B here, as, as you can see. And so looking at those who did not have prior BCMA therapy, uh, they were given, uh, so to some degree similar to teclistimab, we give two uh, step-up doses I- into that first uh, full dose um, in, we- in week two. Um but interestingly, after a patient has had those first six cycles, it naturally drops down to every other week. So instead of teclistimab, that's meant to be every week, um, that it goes down to every other week. The step-up dosing also is a little bit quicker, although I must say for most of us with teclistimab, we don't do what is exactly done in the study where the first a step-up dose is given at day one, the second one at day four, and the third one at day seven. We tend to do one, three, five, so it speeds it up. That's a little bit closer to what's being done here. But nonetheless, um, it has that naturally built-in uh, de-escalation over time. And so looking across the different cohorts based on prior lines of therapy, I mean, we, we see a very similar response rate to what we saw with teclistimab. You know, here ranging between basically 60 and 70 percent, you know, 61 percent in that specific cohort A overall, the 123 patients. So very similar, uh, perhaps a little less cytokine release syndrome and cellular um, uh, toxicities, you know, the cytopenias and infections. But again, um, it's hard to compare across studies, but very similar to what we saw with teclistimab. But interestingly, they definitely did see a reduction in those adverse events when they switched down to the Q weekly dosing. So I think it goes back to what I said earlier, Neil. I think the field is ready to say, okay, we maybe don't have to just keep hitting these T-cells week after week after week. We can back down a little bit more. So it's it's now approved, um, and we're thankful to see more drugs in the market is always good, right? Uh, more options for our patients. Very similar efficacy and toxicity to clistamab, as I've mentioned. I think some of the differentiating features, you know, the way the step-up dosing is given and that natural de-escalation. Um, but as I've mentioned a few times today, I really think the whole field is looking to optimize by specific you know, I say it, Neil, there is no drug in myeloma that we use today exactly the way it was introduced, right? Every drug goes through an evolution, right? We used to give bortezomib IV twice weekly. Now it's sub-Q once a week. You know, Selenexa twice weekly. Now once a week. Dara IV, now sub-Q. I think bispecifics are going to go through a similar kind of evolution as we get to reduce the toxicity, increase its efficacy. So yet another bispecific is the third BCMA driven and probably fourth in line. So this is now the one waiting to catch the bouquet, as it were, would be a linvoseltamab. And so this is also BCMA affiliated, of course, and was based on the linker studies. And so we had updates of this at ASCO. And for time's sake, I won't go through every detail, but again, you see uh, typically, uh, in this case, maybe a slightly shorter hospitalization, step up dosing, and then full dosing ahead, um, where patients are ultimately, if they get a deep response, actually dropping down to Q4 weekly dosing. So maybe even less intense than what we've seen with teclistimab and l And when we look at that cohort of patients, 117 patients were given the recommended dosing here of 200 milligrams, we saw a response rate of 71%. So again, very similar to what we had seen in that 60 to 70% range previously. Um, we arguably maybe see lower rates of cytokine release syndrome with this agent, partly due to the way the step-up dosing is built and so on. Uh, but there are still some patients, of course, that experience CRS. Thankfully, very few of them experience grade 3 CRS. Um, and so uh, I think this is very encouraging. Again, to have more options is always going to be good for our patients. Um, it looks like here they can shorten the hospitalization, although many of us are trying to already do that with the current agents, teclistimab and l where we can even do most of it as an outpatient, especially when you think of how few patients really get to grade 
grade three uh, cytokine release syndrome. So my comments here, you know, we now have a third BCMA driven by specific antibody. This one's not yet approved. Quite similar in its efficacy and toxicity to teclistamab and alronatumab, but maybe lower rates of CRS. And it's hard to know exactly how it's going to fit in. I mean, Neil, you're the expert on this with all your years of experience in oncology. What do you, what do, you do when other drugs very similar to the ones already approved get approved? Uh, and sometimes it's pragmatic differences like cost and, and frequency of administration um, because it's hard to know right now if there's really a big biological difference between these three. And then lastly uh, is the other uh, uh, bispecific antibody, but the first of its kind in that, this is the first one to target, the target we discussed earlier, Neil, of uh, GPRC5D of talquetamab. And I think a couple of important features to see here is, again, very heavily pretreated patients. We see a very impressive response rate. I mean, some could argue it's pretty much the same as the other bispecifics, maybe a little bit higher at 73 or 74% than the sort of mid-60s that we've been seeing before. Again, the majority of these patients do experience cytokine release syndrome, but again, almost exclusively grade one and grade two. So not very much different than what we saw with the BCMA-driven ones. Although interestingly, and it's, I think it's a little too early to, to overstate it, uh, but we actually perhaps see less infection risk with these patients. Um, and not surprising because it's not targeting BCMA, which is expressed on normal CD38 cells. That's why they get so hypogamic anemic. But it's exciting to have our first GPRC5D bispecific antibody approved, strong response rate. I think what we need to learn here, Neil, in light of this evolution of drugs, as I've mentioned, is that th this drug comes with toxicities we're not as familiar with. The dyskesia can really be tough on patients where, you know, they lose their sense of taste. It can be very challenging for them. They can get skin cha changes, nail changes, they can lose their hair. I've had several patients who have been treated with this, um, and we still haven't figured out the best way to do it. Supportive care may help a little bit, but I think it has a lot to do with sheer dose of strategy. It reminds me of the early days of Selenexor, where we just had to change the dose quite significantly to make it easier on patients. And then exactly how it fits in with BCMA strategies is still to come. I just want to chat a little bit with you about some of the things that Dr. Richardson said to me that I'm curious what you think about. So, first thing is uh, determination two. So this is what he wants to do, and I think he's going to do it. I think they, okay. I'm not sure about the funding exactly and exactly when it's happening, but I think it's going to happen. And what he wants to do is ibertamide, isotuximab, bortezomib, dex induction, How's that so far? But instead of lenalidomide, abertamide, instead of um, Dara, Isa. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, I've had the privilege of working a little bit with ibertamide and uh, I'm actually working on a trial that we're about to launch in Latin America with ibertamide. Um, it's an impressive drug. And I think, you know, the plan is ultimately to replace lenalidomide with ibertamide and to replace pomalidomide with mesigdomide, which Paul just reported in the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I, as you know, I had the privilege of leading the first in human study with isotuximab. So this is a, dr a drug that I know quite well that I think is very similar, frankly, to uh, DARA. Um, so I, I think that's a, a good move. You, you know, I think it's, it's very, very appropriate. I'm not sure we're going to see a mind-boggling difference of depth of response because if even with DARA VRD or DARA KRD, we're still seeing over 90% of people respond, right? So, so the benefit here might be that the ibertamide is a little bit easier on the system in my experience, that patients have a little less cytopenia, a little less of the fatigue, uh, even though for some people, lenalidomide is like taking water. Some people can be tough on them. So it may be a smoother induction regimen. Well, he also brought up second primaries as a potential advantage of abertamide versus lenalidomide. But uh, so that's one thing. Which is okay. I agree with that, except we don't have long term data with ibertamide to really know, but understood. So, second thing is it's only going to be high risk, no standard risk patients. Transplant really? versus not. Yeah, he says, he says transplant doesn't work. I mean, I went back and read, incidentally, the New England Journal paper, and I looked at his slides and your slides from your discussion, and there's a number of interesting uh, things there. But, uh, I mean, actually there is is a PFS advantage in standard risk, but it kind of looks like it's not as great. 
But Correct. in any event, it's it's just going to be. I guess it's not so much that there's no benefit, but just maybe not enough benefit to want to put them in the study. But it's going to be all high risk. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a reasonable strategy in the sense that you go to where the greatest benefit right. could potentially be. I I do think that you know the transplanter in me says, well, there was a really good PFS benefit there, right? I think where the issue was was the OS benefit. Um, especially when only a quarter of people got a transplant later. You know, in, in the French study where 80% of people got a transplant in the non-transplant arm, they got it later, people said, oh, the OS similarity between the two arms is because basically everybody got a transplant. And so in the end, it was just the difference between early and late transplant. But here in determination, even with only a quarter or 28% of people getting a, a transplant um, at relapse in the non-transplant arm, there was still no OS benefit. So uh, I think it has swayed some of us who maybe patients were a little bit older, a little bit more frail. Because remember, that study only included 65 years and younger. Those were young patients. Right, 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 right. I'm still getting to the good part. I haven't got to the good part. Okay, yet. okay. Bring me the Anyhow. good part. Sorry. <laughs> I'm still getting Bring there. It. But, you know, it's it's funny. When I went back to uh, the New England Journal paper, I realized that even though everybody gets all excited about the 21-month PFS advantage, the actual hazard rate was 0.7, right? Yeah. That's the not all that great. Not you that know, uh, yeah, I understood. You know, understood. so if, if, if you were to present to the FDA a treatment that had a hazard rate for PFS of 0.7, no difference in survival, and a – you know, a number of AML MDS cases, I'm not sure people will be too excited about it, but okay. Anyhow, yeah, let me get to I, the good I, part. I hear you. And that's why, again, like I told you when I gave the discussant that day, I had to be the independent between the Democrats and the Republicans because they were ready to, oh, to kill each other, you know. But here, here's the good part. And again, maybe you know about this, but I had not heard this. So I think you commented on in the discussion, but I didn't see this in the paper but in the, in the slides that were shown, the hazard rate for PFS for African Americans was pretty much close to one. Yes. Right? Yes, I did comment on that. Well, that's, uh, the sub, apparently the subject of a presentation that's going to be given by, uh, Jeff Zonder at ASH on further analysis of the determination study. And he could not tell me all the details other than the fact that they believe that this difference is biologic. It might also be, I noticed one thing, that the control group in the African Americans hadn't reached their median PFS. So maybe maybe it's just that the treatment without transplant is better in African Americans. I don't know. Or maybe it has something to do with their tolerance of transplant because of the Duffy blood group. And he brought up you know, the whole concept of sickle cell and the evolutionary pressures that developed through that and tying it into the blood, uh, the Duffy blood group. But the bottom line is how few phase three trials there are that had 20% African Americans. Correct. So there might be a whole bunch of things that don't work in African Americans that we don't know about because it wasn't looked at. And yet you all were able to do that in determination. An actual, and I mean, he wouldn't tell me the details because it's embargoed, but that's what right, I know. And, at and this those point. details I, will come. I mean, I mean, so many great things raised here, Neil. And first of all, I just really thank you for raising this because I really do think it's important. Now, you may have remembered in my discussion, I gave an example case, and it was an African American gentleman who ultimately you, exactly. decided not to have the transplant because but for I, that. I remember and, and, you just said. You just said there wasn't a benefit, but you didn't get into like why. Correct. It's just I didn't get it, into the it why. It was just like it was yeah. just the hazard right there that was like one. Correct. And, and I and I don't know if we know for sure. Obviously, I'll have to wait to see Jeff's full presentation. But I know I've been part of the discussion around some of this, and there are many features at play. I mean, one simple way to explain it by biology would be that just like we said earlier, remember the. The, the less high risk people were, the less the benefit of the transplant, right? Meaning the people who benefited the most from the transplant were the highest risk patients. You have to remember that on average, African Americans have less high risk disease. They have less P53 deletion 
more translocation 1114. And the study didn't capture all of that perfectly. So, so there's a bit of a confounding factor there. So that's one of the reasons, for example, we're seeing in VA studies that when given equal access to treatments, African Americans actually do better, despite the fact that right now their mortality is, is twice that of, uh, ca Caucasian individuals. So, so it wouldn't surprise me, of course, if there was some element of, biology with respect to how standard risk uh, patients do. If you have an enriched group of standard risk patients, in this case, African-American patients, it may not be surprising that their benefit from transplant was not as great. The second issue that we're now seeing more so with CAR-T, um, where it's finally being looked at a little bit more carefully, where more African-American, Hispanic-American patients are being treated, we are seeing a difference in toxicity, Neil. We're seeing that Hispanic patients, for example, typically have had longer hospitalizations with CAR-T than non-Hispanic patients with myeloma because of CRS. We know that African-American patients tend to have higher baseline um, inflammatory markers, and that may predict for more uh, CRS. And it's still a bit of a question mark, is, is, is CAR-T more or less effective in African-American patients? So I could wonder in a similar capacity, as you were use the word tolerability uh, or toxicity from transplant, could there be, whether it's related to, you know, Duffy or not, could there be something that that uh, affects that, that it somehow affect ultimately the benefit? I mean, and I'm, I'm, there's a lot of hypothesizing here, uh, but the bottom line is, the maybe the most important thing that comes out of this is exactly what you said, which is saying in a disease where 20% of people in this country with myeloma are African-American, like myself, I'm African-American, we need to be represented in these studies to know what works, what doesn't work, what's more toxic, what's less toxic. It's not acceptable to have these large pivotal studies with 2 to 3% of people African-American because we don't really know what, what, what it does in those individuals. So I'll be interested to hear what Jeff Saunders says. Jeff's a good friend, and I always uh, appreciate his presentations. But there is something here that we want to not avoid. Uh, which is that race matters in, in myeloma. So let me just sort of take it further in terms of disparities. We actually did a presentation last year of the Florida Society of uh, Clinical Oncology on disparities, and I ended up talking about trial accrual. You know, that's such a right, huge, right. gigantic oh, issue. Exactly. And the other thing Jeff told me that I thought was really fascinating is I said, well, what do you think the reason was that you, you were so successful, your group, in getting accruals? And I thought his answer was very interesting. He said, one of the things that we thought was really important was African-American docs. Yes, absolutely. Oncologists. It makes complete sense to me. And he felt like that was a big reason they, that they were able to get so many patients in there. But I just see this as a wake-up call that's way beyond myeloma. Way beyond. Oh, I my completely life. agree with you, Neil. Neil, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and that is part of the strategy why I think they were successful. I also think they they chose good centers to do it in. You know, I bu built this uh, document of like the twelve things that we can do to improve diversity in clinical trials. That's one of them. Not not to get us too far on a side, but just so you know, I partnered with the National Medical Association, created a program for minority mm. medical students to do a project with a myeloma doctor in health disparities in myeloma. And we brought them all together to the annual National Medical Association meeting a few weeks ago in uh, in uh, New Orleans, and they all presented their posters. And you know who was there? The director of the NCI, Monica Bertinoli. And I convinced her to come join me, do the poster walk. So here are these medical students, first, second year medical students presenting, because that is an issue. You know, 14% of the population is African American, but only 6% of us are physicians. So it's only 6% of physicians in this country are African American. So I think that's part of the solution, whether it's the physician or a member of their team that makes that person feel comfortable that someone looks like them. And this, this applies within the African American community, the Hispanic community, many other communities as well. And I think it's part of that strategy. It's also choosing the right sites. Like we don't do everything at Mayo and Memorial Sloan Kettering and, 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 uh, uh, you know, MD Anderson, although those places are doing their best. We need to include more studies in Louisiana and Alabama and places where, um, where, uh, many of these uh, patients live. So, yeah, actually, when we did that presentation, we were showing a bunch of videos. We showed a video of Ruben Mesa talking about, you know, Hispanic culture and how, you know, they uh, utilize that in terms of trial accrual. But, you know, when you said uh, the Cartitude study was going to be the number one paper of the year, I was like, 
I wonder about Jeff Zonder's paper at Ash. Because <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's true. That I will think be. I, if it really plays out the way he's saying it is, and again, I'm thinking way beyond myeloma. I mean, how do we trust our data? Look at that hazard rate. It's like on one for the African American. Yeah. We yeah. never would have known that. So to Absolutely. me, if this becomes a wake up call in general for accrual to minorities, I think it should be. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's a big part of what I do every day and I believe in it because I, I've seen sadly, you know, what happens when individual like this and, and you say it goes beyond myeloma, but it's particularly pertinent to myeloma because myeloma absolutely has the largest fraction of patients who are African American, 20% because the risk is twice as high. And actually, if you look at all cancers, Neil, all cancers, the greatest disparity is in myeloma between the African American population and the white population. That's where you see that double of the mortality. This concludes our program. Special thanks to Dr. McHale, and thank you for listening. This is Dr. Neil Love for Oncology Today. 